Floridians to drive down and uh, come see that exhibit. And we're also going to be um, having a lot of events that tie into diving and pop culture. One of them will be next month kicking off our Blue Star Museum program, which launches on Armed Forces Day this year. That is May 15th. And it's followed by our May Immerse Yourself, which will be Rear Admiral Martha Herb. Yep. And she's going to be talking about U.S. Navy uh, diving and uh, some of the different operations and, and ships and equipment that they use. So that's going to really tie into our military Blue Star program and uh, Armed Services, Armed Forces Day kickoff. So a lot's going on. We also want to thank our sponsors, uh, Dennis and Lee Culture Jerome and the Draves family who made this Immerse Yourself uh, night possible. So if any of you all have thought about becoming a sponsor for the Immerse Yourself programs, please uh, send me an email, director at divingmuseum.org. We've got lots of opportunities. And uh, Emily's going to give us some of the technical highlights of what's going to happen tonight. And then I think we can start recording. Oh, oh no. Oh no. Oh no, you froze up again for a second. Uh oh. <laughs> but you're good now. <laughs> okay. So give them the uh, technical highlights and then we will, uh, I'll introduce Will and we'll get started with our night. Okay. You can start recording. Right. Oh, I actually did already. So <laughs> I beat oh, you okay. to it. <laughs> there you go. All right. All um, right. Okay, so as folks are just coming in, if you are new to Immerse Yourself, we do record the presentation. Um, so in case you have friends that were interested that weren't able to make it, we, you, we will have it on our YouTube and um, I will have that available to share on our Facebook probably sometime tomorrow. Or if you want it, I can directly email you the link to it as well. Um, if you have any questions for Will during the course of the presentation, you can send them to me in the chat feature. It's pretty easy, just send it to me. And then at the end of the presentation, I will field them to Will. So we'll do that for about 10, 15 minutes or so um, post presentation. Also, as Lisa was mentioning, um, if you can be so kind to, even though I know some of you told me where you're at watching from anyway, if you could send us through the chat where you're watching and um, how many folks are at your house watching with you, this helps us for grant applications and things like that. So we know how much, how many people we're actually reaching and how far our reach is, which really helps to um, receive for funding and things like that uh, later on. So without further ado, I'm going to push it back to. Um, oh, hold on, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we can we can do that, Will. Um, and actually, I can unmute you, so you can so you can talk. <laughs> um, so Will did say that if you guys have questions, send them to me through the chat, and I will try and get them. I will ask them it in at live, I guess, um, to Will as you guys send them. So okay, that works for that. So I'm going to pin you back, Lisa. So the History of Diving Museum would like to welcome Will Yanni. He has been a support diver for the Cirque du Soleil O in Las Vegas, as well as a lot of other diving um, things that we'll learn about tonight. So thank you for being here, Will. Thank you for helping us kick off diving into pop culture. We thought uh, the Cirque du Soleil is a perfect example of blending theatrical performances with the water and uh, different occupations and things that you can do. So, Will, the, the floor is yours. Perfect. I'm going to try to switch to this presentation. And uh, if it's not working, please let me know. You should be seeing it somewhat now. Mm -hmm. Looks, great. Looks great. All right. I'm going to minimize this because it's going to confuse me. All right, so everyone, uh, welcome to Immerse Yourself Diving Into Entertainment, AKA Diving Into O, which is how it was publicized on the uh, group or through the History of Diving Museum. Thank you so much for having me here. Uh, a little bit about, oh, here we go. Gotta be in presentation mode. All right, so uh, I'm gonna start it off with just a quick little video that's kind of the, 
not really the intro to O, but a very good kind of outlier. So if you have never seen O, you can have kind of this idea of what O is. Uh, and then from there, the presentation is broken into kind of multiple parts that kind of connects a bunch of different theatrical disciplines and kind of explains a little bit about each of them. And most of it will be about diving underwater or no. But so before I really start, I want to just kind of start this video and then we'll continue to talk about it. <laughs> Wait 10 years because we always separate. We wait 10 years and start working together. But this is, is very, very amazing. We feel uh, very good to stay together. No, we're very happy because yeah. this is his dream. His dream, yeah. We stay together, we work together, we laugh together. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Trust together with can I can't open legs, <laughs> she can't open eyes. Yeah. It's impossible because if we fall, we fall together. We can't talk underwater. We have, we actually can talk underwater. I think it crosses language barriers, element barriers, because it just, you've, we've made it natural to us. We've made the water our home. You know, it's almost easier for us to be in the water than to, to just walk down the street. from different country, all a different background, speaking different language, can just get in that pool 
and make it happen like they swim together for 10 years. Because it takes a long time to get that in sync and to get that harmony. But when you see those moments in the water with 10 different countries right in there, it's amazing. So that's just kind of a little bit of introduction into what O is and um, kind of the, the symbiotic relationship that divers and, and artists have with each other. You just saw basically the ending of the act of the Alamovas, which is a pair of Russian twins doing their trapeze act and they get caught underwater because there is no net in the O show. They, they just have this giant pool. So in any circus act that would require there to be a net, uh, they just have this giant pool they fall into it and there's two aquatics members, which would be one of someone that I worked with or someone that had the position that I worked with. And we would catch them and we would swim them to uh, synchronize swimmers. So we would then make a platform and lift them up into the water. And there's many acts inside of Cirque du Soleil's O that involve an integration of artist and underwater technician to kind of make all of these things happen. Uh, so again, my name is Will. I have an MFA in scenic and projection design from the University of Florida. Uh, I'm a pretty active technical cave diver. I used to work for the O Show, which closed at the beginning of COVID, but they're starting to recruit people. Uh, there were a couple internal email, emails that were sent out probably less than a week ago. So if this is something that you might be interested in, there's, there is a possibility that there are a bunch of open openings in this type of show. And if you would like to reach out to the museum, I can put you in touch with people that are in charge. Uh, prior to that, I was a fireworks and safety boat driver for Reflections of Earth, which is a Disney show that is also no longer offered. Currently, I work for World Wrestling Entertainment, uh, and I've been a safety boat operator and driver and a diver for some TV, some movies, and some special events. Uh, here are just two pictures from my buddy Grill. One of them is uh, inside of a cave that's here local in Florida. It's called Chaplin's. That's going to be the one on your left. And on the right is a picture of the Windjammer, which is a sailboat that sank full of tar off of Bonaire. All right, so diving in Cirque du Soleil. Um, there's going to be a lot of pictures throughout this um, that are going to be artists being handled by divers. Uh, all of these divers that you see are going to be members of the aquatics department. Anyone that handles an artist is going to be part of the aquatics department, and we'll talk about that in a second. There are other divers in this show uh, that are not specifically handling people. Um, they're going to fall into either carpentry or rigging, and we'll talk about that as well. And those are going to be people that are moving set pieces underwater. Uh, so just a little bit of information. So there's 150 performers in text uh, on near or around the water. There's 14 techs that are underwater. So six of those are gonna be safety divers. Uh, seven of the, or six of them are carpenters, two of them are riggers. And then one extra person is going to be, a, it's called a wet dry track. So they'll be underwater scuba diving for some of the show and the other half they're getting stuff in and out of the water. Um, so of that group, there's six people that are part of the aquatics department, also known as artist handlers. Um, of that six people, it's just divided into two groups of three. There's a left side and a right side. Each of those have someone that's going to be on a full face mask, either an Aga or a Guardian. Uh, both of them, either regardless of a mask you have, they have the ability to push the talk, to talk to someone upstairs in the crow's nest. And the person in the crow's nest is going to be the lead safety diver. They're not in the pool at all. They're basically just situated exactly above the pool looking down and they can see what's happening via cameras. And they integrate everything with stage management. If you don't know anything about shows, uh, basically the stage manager is the person that calls every single light cue, sound cue, automation. So if anything needs to move, they're the people that verify that everything is safe before it happens. It's very hard, at least in this type of show, for them to be aware of every single thing that's happening in the pool and what's happening on the surface. So the crow's nest kind of fulfills this like inter intermittent or intermediate kind of contact for them. If there's any type of problem in the pool, the crow's nest guy can handle it and they can relay everything to stage management. Uh, so next we have Bob Sawyer. He was the operations production manager. This is a very short clip. And it's, again, it's just gonna be more stuff of us underwater. Under here at the Ocho. In the pool, we have six members of the aquatics team in there. 
So in this shot, we're actually looking from the front of the pool, looking the back. The divers actually, the dive con guys on the aquatic scene are in a full face mask. So that means they can actually communicate to what we call the crow's nest. They're kind of like the safety officers in the pool. So they watch everything that's going on. One is stage left, one is on stage right. Very, very simple. Um, so again, it's just pictures and videos of people handling artists. And when we get closer to the end of the presentation, I'll be talking through very specific what's the happening. Um, but first we're gonna talk a little bit about gear configuration. So all of the artist handlers and basically anyone that's diving in the pool has a very different setup than an open water diver. Uh, they're gonna start with the regulator in their mouth. Uh, then they all have some sort of air to so some sort of inflator slash regulator that you can breathe off of. And then on each side of their regulator, they have two additional uh, regulators that they can donate to people. So this lets a single safety diver donate to up to five people, and then they can switch to their air to which will let them donate to the sixth person. And then situated throughout the entire pool, there's, or not situated throughout, but there's two slots in the pool where we have pony bottles that allow them to do an additional four. So at any point in time, one diver can supply gas to nine different people in the pool. And it's mainly, they use that for setting up that Alamova falling into the water onto the platform of synchronized swimmers. But it also exists because in the before time, in the long, long ago when they were making the show, uh, they didn't really understand how everything would impact each other. And so they had extra gas throughout the stage. And we'll talk about that in the next slide. I'm Bryn Butzman. I'm a synchronized swimmer here at O at the Bellagio in Las Vegas. We have a lot of interaction with the artist handlers in the show. Um, it's a big part because that's how we breathe through the whole show. We do our first act where there's masking and there's a bunch of little bubbles that come up and if there's that those bubbles happening we can't hear we can't see creates a big current so you're pushed around everywhere in the water I mean it's really dependent on on them to to do our job we really work together we have to have a good trust and relationship with that character because it's pretty important it's a teamwork from the from the artist to the technician this so number doesn't work anymore by the way just so you know it, it, hopefully it comes back um, so we're just going to talk a little bit about the theater. So this theater is actually a very traditionally laid out theater, and it's 100% a copy of the Theater del Paris, which is in Paris. It's their biggest opera house. If you had a side, I don't have a side-by-side -side photo, but if you did, you would see that they're very, 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 very similar. Um, this theater is specifically designed to house a water show. So every single seat has a sensor underneath it um, that controls uh, ambient temperature. So basically every single, every fourth seat in the house is actually air conditioned because they wanted the pool to be 88 degrees because that's a good temperature for performers and for people working in the show. And then the rest of the theater, they wanted it to be cool for people. So they have a very, very, very intricate uh, air conditioning system in this theater. Uh, they also have a very intricate sound system to kind of mitigate going through water and things like that. And if you look at the roof, right up here, it's actually just this big wire mesh grid. And what actually happens is the hot water, the air that comes off of it actually gets pushed into the ceiling and then it gets sucked out of the theater. Uh, so the audience members, it's the weirdest experience you'll ever, ex ever have. If you walk up to the pool, it smells like a pool. And if you walk two steps away from it, the pool smell just completely disappears. So it's kind of, it's, I mean, so the show was made in 1998 and they literally pulled all those stops out from a technological standpoint to make this theater be every single thing that a traditional theater would be and quote en encompassing also this gigantic four yes. swimming pools yeah. uh so again back to the basic theater layout um so the set i i made this quick little drafting just to kind of show you what the actual stage looks like uh, there's just a series of lifts. The pool itself is 27 feet deep, uh, but the scissor lifts, the mechanism that lifts each of these individual lifts up uh, can only compress to be at smallest a little bit less than five feet. So the actual depth of the pool on top of the platform is about 27 feet deep. Uh, lifts one, two, three, and four can go all the way down to the bottom. Uh, lifts five and lift six can go down about six feet and lift seven can only go down about two feet. Uh, and the, they basically use the pool as a giant mirror for a lot of the acts. And they are very, 
the show is very much lit and set up in a way that like if the lift is just a little bit underwater it looks like as if it completely doesn't exist and it's it's a very kind of beautiful surreal thing and if you have an interest in like art and architecture there, you can actually walk up. So just if you're interested in the show at all, they posted the entire show to YouTube at the very be beginning of the pandemic. Uh, I'll find a link for you guys, um, but you can watch the entire show and they use the, the pool being a mirror very effectively throughout basically the entire show to hide what's going on underneath. So here's just that kind of side picture of uh, what we see on the left hand is lift number four, and that's the scissor lifts. Um, there's also these big casins right here. So that's just basically a gigantic hydraulic piston and it's filled with some sort of vegetable oil. It's not filled with real oil because they were worried if they break, what happens? Uh, the answer is the whole pool smells like a giant uh, McDonald's fryer. Because uh, <laughs> it just kind of like, it goes literally everywhere. Uh, and so these lifts are set up that these basically lift everything up and then they lock into place. Um, and all the lifts can go to different sizes or different heights, but when they break, and sometimes they do break in the middle of the show, we try to get them down all the way to the bottom. And then the performers just have to remember that that lift doesn't exist. So throughout the course of a show, sometimes things will break and people will just assume that a lift is there, that is normally there, but they just can't see it and they just pile drive right into the water. But again, that is a that is a kind of moot point. So the lifts are safest when they're at the bottom because it prevents people from like high diving into them and things like that. But so the lifts can go all the way down to be 25 feet deep or they can go up an additional two feet so they can actually rise above the surface of the water a little bit. Uh, here's this big hydraulic this is the end all be all. This is the hydraulic terminal room. So anytime one of the lifts gets broken, there's a series of valves. You can see them just right here. If you switch two of them off, it shuts off each lift essentially. And they have this box that you can't see that's located right here. And you can actually lock, um, lock lifts out of commission, just like a normal lockout tag out for like anything type that's electrical or anything like that. And again, it's just kind of for safety. I just think that this is a really cool photo that it's kind of like the underbelly uh, of this show that most people would never actually get to see. I've got a question, Will. Flint. Is there space under the lifts when they go down in case there's a diver underneath? Um, no. Well, <laughs> depends. So I'm going to go back. So these areas right here are basically no swim zones, right? Uh, if it went all the way down, there would be a little bit of space, but something that's not listed or not on this photo, because this is when they were originally installing it, is on any, I'm going to go back to here, on any surface of lift that runs into uh, anything else that could become a potential pinch point, um, there's e-stops. So it's essentially a piece, it's a piece of basically rubber that has a sensor every every 12-ish inches. And when that goes, when that gets pressed up, it puts that lift into something called a fault. So a fault is like the sensor caught something that is like someone's about to get crushed or something like that. And it actually dead stops it. And that's actually the main reason that dive com um, divers are able to talk with someone because normally it's the dive com people that are setting off the lift sensors because there's someone that's somewhere that they're not, they're not supposed to be. Uh, so then they'll just put that lift in fault. They get that other person off or out from underneath where that lift is, and then everything just continues. So they've never had someone get caught. It's also like very much dra like uh, drilled into you that this area, you can see that right. Yeah, so this area is strictly off limits with very few counterpoints like sometimes things will break inside of them which then they you obviously would have to go inside of them to fix it but that's going to result in something happening in this room that makes it so that it's safe for you to be inside of it okay perfect thank you yeah no worries uh so this is just another kind of back shot of the pool so here are lifts uh five six and seven just kind of slightly underwater um it's it's less than three inches but it, from the audience perspective, it looks like because if they're completely disappeared. These are all people now watching this. 
I don't know what it is. There you are. Yeah, but the ones underneath are all people that are watching it now. Oh, yes, I understand. Right? That, baby. I, I'm but just saying. Um, so I'm going to show a little thing about the beginning of this show. So the show has this huge fascin fascination with its front curtain. And they actually have this curtain uh, equipped with a gigantic roller so it can like pull itself away from the, from the audience, which is, it's, it's, it's absolutely beautiful. And then the floor is also covered in the same curtain material and it's able to open up at the beginning of the show. So this is the little literal opening of the show. So there's also this big illusion within the show that the pool is like kind of this suspect of the moon and it's purely based on this image, which I also think is something that most people will never see because you actually never see the pool from the top. Um, I'm actually pretty sure that this movie was shot or this part of this scene was shot by James Cameron, I'm pretty sure. I'm not 100%, but it's just a very pretty perspective. Um, so before that, when we load all of the synchronized swimmers into the audience, this is what the pre-show would look like. So all of these synchronized swimmers, uh, there's 16 of them, and then there's one male synchronized swimmer. A they, of freedom. Um, they get to swim underneath this curtain that you guys just saw, and there's going to be an artist handler underneath there to give them basically gigantic hookah regs. So there's four hookah regs that come off of, or eight hookah regs that come off of each side. And um, what you're seeing right now is something called underwater masking. Um, so this is what the, this is what the design is. This is the, the intent of this, all these little micro bubbles is to hide from the audience. It's actually happening under the water. Uh, it makes it very hard to see. It makes it very hard to hear. You actually, this image has one of the artist handlers carrying something called the Rover, which is this like, uh, underwater speaker uh, that they basically have to swim closer to the synchronized swimmer so they can hear the music. Uh, water is very effective at, rem at removing sound, it's specifically higher frequencies. And when they first made the show, underwater speakers didn't exist. Um, so the audio department actually invented them essentially to do what they needed them to do. Um, so underwater, you hear a very simplified mix of like what is actually being played, but it's still kind of this cool, important, um, it's just kind of this cool, important, you know, little good to know that it's just absolutely, you can't see anything when you're originally learning this track or these tracks for the show, when they turn the masking on, they teach you to like follow the floor because you can figure out where you are based on what lift you're on top of, but this, I don't even think that this really does it justice of how little you can physically see. And I'm guessing that to film this, they actually had to turn down the amount of bubbles that exist. That's Bill, that's one of the synchronized swimmers. He's, he's a hoot. Uh, so underwater masking. So this is what they can make the top of the pool look like when all those little bubbles are going down and they can turn it down and they can turn it up. Uh, originally, they also had there's also this gigantic wave machine that's installed inside of the pool and they've only ever used it one time and they turned it on and it flooded the theater after they, they just put thousands upon thousands of dollars in seats in it. So they just, they just have never used that, but they have the capability of doing absolutely crazy stuff in this pool and they just can't. So uh, this is uh, a picture in underwater masking. This is the exact same uh, look with essentially masking, it's inverted, but it's the exact same look. So just like the pool's either absolutely clear and you can see everything or you cannot see anything. And that's just like a fun little bit about. So this, this video, what you're hearing in the background is actually the, 
is the guy in the crow's nest that's giving you a countdown for people falling into the water. So the Alamo is, is again this trapeze act. So they fall into the water. That's that's Jim. We'll go back in a second. So they fall into the water. Uh, there's two guys that catch them and they put a regulator in their mouth and it's imperative that those people are very fast. They're also dealing with refraction. So you're looking up at people that are not in the water. So where you think that they're going to land and where they actually land is something that you have to get used to. Uh, so those performers have done this act and it's, it's about nine minutes long. So they fall into the water with their hands out like this. Uh, you find their hand, and when they land, it's just there's just a bunch of bubbles. Put a regulator in their hand, they put the regulator in their mouth. You swim them to the synchronized swimmers, put them on top of the synchronized swimmers. As soon as they get close to the surface, you tap them on the hand, they spit the regulator out, you disappear, and then they pop up. And then the same thing happens in reverse after the bow. So they do their bow, they come back down, you put a regulator back in their hand, and they are normally breathing very heavily uh, because they just did this crazy psycho trapeze act where they're like holding each other and throwing each other around and then we just swim them off stage and then you either high five them or they like tell you how great you are and you say no no no, you're so great and then you go back into the pool and just continue doing the rest of your cues but so between the artists and the divers, there's got to be a, a, a solid element of trust. That's usually established out of the water. And then once we get in the water to keep things fluid, we just have to truly trust that we're going to be there for them when they need us. My name, His name is Jim. I cut this a little bit too early. I'm sorry, Jim. Great. Um, so here's just more it's just underwater you. looking at people. Um, getting ready pre-show. So again, the giant curtain hasn't flipped open yet. And we actually might see it in this clip that it's gonna get very dark because they turn all the lights off in the pools and then they turn them all on really slowly as it opens up and it just kind of adds to the visual appear, appeal. Uh, so now we're gonna kind of go into like individual departments and kind of talk about what they do. Uh, the first one is going to be carpentry. It's not, a, they're responsible for kind of building and maintaining every single thing that exists in the pool. So there's a couple guys that are underwater welders. Uh, there's a bunch of people in that department that are just fabricators. Uh, the whole floor is made out of this material called Mondo, which is like a, a super plastic. Uh, it does not get slippery when wet. Uh, the whole stage floor also has a hole drilled in it every like three quarters of an inch. So it's just this big, gigantic, perforated decking system so that when the lifts go up, they don't push water out to the audience. The water actually flows through them. So they're responsible for things like that. Uh, there's this barge right here. Um, if you look at anything in the show that's floating in the water, it is not moved by any sort of propulsion. That is not a couple dudes with some ropes dragging them across the floor. Uh, you can kind of see right here, there's this rope that they clip into the floor. And what they do is they basically just wear a harness and they just drag it out. Uh, so props to the carpentry department that sets everything up. They're also responsible for any of the props. Uh, most of the props are operated and driven by the performer. Um, some of them uh, are pushed around like the house that there's a group of clowns that are on that's pushed around by carpenters. Carpenters also help with the fire act. So when people get lit on fire or get put out, that's also going to be either a member of the aquatics department lighting them on fire or the carpentry department putting them out. Uh, there's also a couple cues within the show. So a cue is something that has to happen to kind of further the progression of the show. Uh, there are a few cues where carpenters dress up as performers and go out with the performers and do very specific tasks. Um, and they're just if you are watching the show, you will never know. But at the end of the video, I have a couple cues of, the, of carpenters walking out and doing um, just like some odd jobs. And if you were watching the show normally, you would never know that they exist. Uh, so costuming. Uh, there's a full-time wig crew. It's It was eight ladies that were working when I was there. So all, their whole job every single day was just to create wigs. Um, they go through a ton of laundry for this show. The Every single performer, if they get in the pool and then they come back, 
five minutes later, they're completely dry. And how they accomplish that is they just do a complete costume change. So the people, the performers get out of the water, they go out, they dry off, they put on a completely new pair of clothes, and then they come back out. If they have a wig, they switch to a completely new wig that's been, um, uh, has been dressed. Um, tons and tons and tons and tons and tons of costumes, tons and tons and tons and tons of laundry. The costuming people, you know, really go above and beyond. They also have, I think, two cobblers. Stuff started to change once when I left a couple of years ago. So either there's three cobblers that work in this big central shop and each show has one or they, or they have two. I, I just don't know how it is right now. Also, they've been closed for about eight months. So I just don't know. Uh, however, what I do know is that we're the only show in existence that does an underwater costume change that involves taking someone's clothes from one look to a completely different look, swimming, swimming them about 100 yards in about 12 seconds. And that's what this video looks like. So this guy is pulled from the audience and he ends up being kind of the main character throughout the whole show. So he falls into the water. Uh, and what's happening right now is there's someone put a regulator's mouth and there's two people just ripping all his clothes off. And by the time, by the time Bill May, the guy in the middle, gets to the outside, he's completely changed and he's hanging out right under the thing. So, that was the only show in existence that I know that has a costume change that is that long that also involves someone being swam across the pool and all their clothes being removed and new clothes being put on. Uh, so into rigging. So the top deck of the stage is called the Teleferique. It has these gigantic um, uh, automated tracks that something the called the carousel can move across on. Uh, I think I have a picture of the carousel. I'll come back to this. So this is the carousel. So it's just this gigantic rotating wheel that they can use to fulfill a variety of purposes. One of them is that they can make something called the bateau, which is a trapeze act that looks like a boat, can rock back and forth. They also use it to set up something called the Washington trapeze, which is a giant trapeze where uh, Anya, the lady in charge, or the lady that does the act, does an inverted or does a headstand on a trapeze bar as it's swinging out over the audience. It's pretty cool. Uh, but so that's all going to be uh, facilitated with this carousel that moves up and down that track. Uh, the riggers also assist a lot of the acts. So this, I think that's been right there. I'm not 100% sure. But so when these performers are climbing up this ladder right now, he's just holding it out of the way, but he also holds it steady. Uh, also in the trapeze acts, when they're swinging, they assist them to pull them back farther so they can start swinging faster. And that's also done by riggers that essentially just have a rope on a pulley. And they, whenever they see the performers pulling back, they just add additional weight to it. Uh, but it takes a long time to learn how to do that uh, so that you don't impede the, the performance. Uh, the other thing that riggers do that isn't depicted, I don't think in this presentation is they fly people around the stage and again so that's going to be another um very specialized skill and it also involves a lot of trust between the person that's doing the flying and the person and the artist in the air because it's very easy to hurt people so rigging department's also responsible for that giant curtain that you saw at the beginning and i have this video which i don't know if i'm allowed to have i took it years and years and years ago so if it's not allowed please someone let me know in the company that can tell me, but so this is what that curtain looks like from reverse. It's actually really loud and cool, so maybe I'll give it a sound. This is not during a show. This is because there was a problem with it that we were fixing. The riggers would be responsible for ensuring that this kind of thing is working. Uh, the next one is special effects, SFX. So there's a bunch of fog, low-lying fog, which is going to be made by CO2. Uh, they also have the ability to make it rain uh, throughout the show. So there's a couple acts where it rains on everyone. Um, 
it's just kind of crazy stuff that you wouldn't think about. Uh, the low lying fog is something that's super hard to figure out in an air conditioned room because you have to figure out where all the air conditioning is and you have to figure out what you have to turn on and what you have to turn off to get fog in the appropriate places. So that's just uh, kind of this, if you haven't ever done it before, it's kind of a pain, but it's very beautiful within the course of the show. Uh, the next one is stage management, lighting and automation. Uh, these are the people that kind of make everything happen. They sit up in a booth, uh, this top here is automation. So those guys are able to see all the lifts. You can see that they have a bunch of video cameras. So their goal is not to crush anyone. So they have to make sure that whatever they're moving is clear before uh, any type of movement happens. Uh, this person right here is just sitting at one of the lighting desks. They have two. Uh, one of them is just running in backup essentially. So if this one is to break, then they can just switch to the other one. Seamless transition, you don't even know. Uh, stage management booth looks a lot like this, except for they have a bunch of these video screens that are just going to be uh, monitor cameras so they can kind of see where people are. There's, I just don't have a good photo of that. Um, but just want to give a shout out to those guys. Uh, and then of course to the cast. So this is the original cast. Uh, by the time I started working there almost uh, 18 years after the fact, 19 years after the fact, uh, most of these cast members are still there, which is kind of like a cool, neat thing to have. Um, and so that's kind of the end of the presentation. And I promised you all a YouTube video. So I'm going to hop over to YouTube real quick and I'm going to show you two kind of, I don't know, if you can't see what I'm sharing, please. Someone what like, you'll probably have to do is um, reopen the YouTube screen. Okay. Should be able to go like this. Where is it? I need an adult. Yeah. I'm bringing in technical help. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, special effects. My preferred term. Mm -hmm. I do have a question for you, Will. Yep. Um, where'd it go? With all the support teams, how many are there daily to make the show happen? Uh, so wardrobe is going to have probably close to 30 people working. Uh, carpentry has, I think, 12 for a normal show day, but so that's going to also encompass three people that are there in the morning just as like preventative maintenance. Uh, aquatics has six plus the crow's nest so that's seven and they have two guys that are working during the day so that's nine so now we're at uh 52 people uh and then lighting has 10 spotlight operators and then a couple other day crew guys so probably pretty close to like 90 by the time you get through everyone impressive uh yeah i mean it's a very technical intensive show mm -hmm. um and because there's a bunch of like intricate moving parts and like the, uh, you're also doing everything in a giant pool, which is relatively corrosive. So they have to do a bunch of maintenance on stuff all the time. Otherwise uh, it just becomes completely impossible to keep the show running. Right. Um, and they also drain the pool once a year in order to like do maintenance. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like the week off, the, it's two weeks off for all the artists. Uh, and that's when a lot of that maintenance is done. But uh, there's 150 people in the cast, I think is somewhere around 60 something. So 90 other people are required to make the show work. Gotcha. Can you see the YouTube? Uh, no. Excellent. So you right. share. Lene is on it. Okay, cool. And I, oh, perfect. Can you see now? Yes. So if you want to Great. do full screen. Yep. Uh, so if you just go to YouTube and you search through Soleil O full show, you can watch the entire show, um, which is fun and exciting. We won't have any of the underwater shots, but it's still pretty great. Uh, so just uh, like we have a bunch of artists that are running around on the stage right now. You're going to see four guys in red walk out. They're called Comets, the two guys in the back are going to be carpenters and their faces ironically in this video are blacked out because they there isn't they're not supposed to be on camera 
So that guy that just ran off with the black face, uh, that's obviously just a quick edit and delete. Uh, that would be something that carpenters would do on stage that no one would really see. And the, my favorite part of this entire show is right about here. So this is gonna kind of, they love, Cirque du Soleil loves pulling plants out of the audience. Uh, and I skipped the thing that I wanted to see. Um, so this is the end of an act. We're gonna see carpenters right here. That's carpenter, that's carpenter right there. They're not doing anything flashy. They're just holding stuff still so that it doesn't get pushed around in the artificial wind that's created by the air conditioning whenever those gigantic things move. This is a little bit of kind of like comedy fun. I feel like as if I am in the wrong spot. I need two seconds to figure out where okay. it is. All right. So here are people being flown by the rigging department. So how it basically works is they can just control your speed up and your speed down. All of the left to right stuff is all handled by the performer. You know, but again, if you land someone very hard, then they basically break their legs. So it's a, it's a pretty fluid process and how it normally works is riggers start by flying like a sandbag. And then when they get comfortable with that, they fly another rigger. And then when they get comfortable with that, they fly um, someone else. This guy's name is Ray. He gets lit on fire like six times a night. He has the world record for the person that's been lit on fire the most. And he breaks his record every single night because he's never missed a show in like 25 years. So that's fun. Um, so what we're about to see right now is the best act in the entire show. It's called Dead Fish. Uh, essentially what it is is all of the underwater divers get trapped on stage. And they really, honestly, everyone can make it off stage, but it just kind of gives like this extra little, little level of uh, kind of like a, a nod to the fact that they exist. So. All those girls that are turning in circles right now are the synchronized swimmers. They come up, they start walking away, and then you see a bunch of little scuba divers. And one of these people could have been me, but I wasn't here for this filming. So it's basically just the entire aquatics department, all these people that are just flapping their fins away. And um, to me, this is kind of like the best send off that you can get. So normally on your last day, they they put you right up in front and all the, uh, all the performers come and say bye to you. And the audience doesn't really know what it means, but it's kind of like your last time that you are a part of the show. And with that, that's it. Um, I would love if every single person went and watched this whole video. It's it's an hour and a half uh, with like a four minute introduction. It's a beautiful thing. Um, and if there's any questions, uh, I would love to field them. Yeah, no, I've, I've got some. And also, um, while you were doing your presentation, I did find a couple other links for YouTube about the show, which might be a bit more of the behind the scenes stuff from the actual Cirque du Soleil um, YouTube channel. Yeah, they have a bunch. And basically the clips that I pulled are going to be right. from one of those. Yeah, so I'm going to send those to everyone right now. Hopefully they work the way um, they <laughs> the way I hope they do. Um, so I do have a bunch of questions that were coming in just as we were you know, starting to wrap up. Um, and a couple of them are kind of tied together. So could you describe the selection and training program for the artist performers, the safety divers, and the other specialists? Like, what do you need to have on your resume to get this job? <laughs> so realistically, the only requirement to be in the aquatics department is you have to be a dive master. There's no, there's no crazy training requirements. I will say that it's very competitive. <laughs> what about, am I messing it up? No, you're uh, doing a great job. I just wanted to see your face. Oh. I, I cool. took it off him. <laughs> it's fine. Um, so really to be an artist handler, you just have to be a dive master. There's really no, uh, no other requirements. Um, if you, have a very strong understanding of how show support and structure works. Obviously that is going to be preferred. Uh, everyone in the aquatics department is actually 
has basically been an instructor. I don't think that they actually ever hired just a dive, not just a dive master, but someone that only had a dive master certification unless they had like uh, commercial diving experience or something along those lines. Uh, performers get trained, scoop, get trained to be, uh, when I was there trained to be a rescue diver, um, you have to basically, it's, so ironically, you have to pass the swim test the day that you get hired, um, which is done by the aquatics department, even if you're like an Olympic synchronized swimmer, which all of them went to the Olympics multiple times. So it's like to me that you're like, you have to swim 200 yards and tread water for a little bit. And they just like laugh at you. And then you're like, no, really, you have to do this. Uh, so you have to be able to pass the swim test. You have to be a dive master to be in the aquatics department. To be in any of the other departments, um, you don't even have to be scuba certified. Uh, the only requirement is that to get in the pool, you have to become at least a rescue diver. And normally that's all company paid. Uh, so all the carpenters, all the rigging guys that are in the water are all gonna be rescue divers or above. Um, and most of that is done by the day crew of the aquatics department. They just teach, they're, everyone's an open water instructor basically. So they just teach water skills to them. Excellent. Um, how many times a day, how many times is this show done per day? So traditionally the show was dark. So no shows perform Monday and Tuesday, but maintenance crew would still come in. Um, but so then it's two shows a day. So Wednesday through Sunday, two shows a day. Okay. First show started at seven. So the second show started at nine. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, in your experience, was there ever a major underwater malfunction? Um, so, uh, I was a part of a couple of those lifts breaking, which is kind of a big deal, or, um, there's like a hookah regulator system that goes across the whole thing. Uh, we lost that for a couple shows, which there's a bunch of like fixes in line. So basically you can just hook up a, a tank to it and continue to run it. Um, most of what we actually responded to like problem wise would be injuries because everything is above this big pool. So artist handlers not only deal with um, artists in the water, like during the show, they're, they're, our primary like purpose would be for rescues. Mm -hmm. uh, so most, most of the things that actually involved would be us doing a rescue with performance medicine. So performance medicine is basically uh doc trainers that doctors and trainers that are there for the show to specifically help people stabilize people and get them into an ambulance but so for the aquatics department they also make all of us emts and um lifeguards right so uh any type of injury which is normally like during like a trapeze act two people run into each other uh in a normal circus they would fall into a net and oh they fall into a giant pool uh, so every single thing that happens also has the possibility of someone drowning. So that's really why like the crow's nest is there and you can talk to people underwater and he, he or she can, you know, right. tell us where someone is and we can get them to the surface as fast as possible. Yeah. Oh, excellent. But, yeah. Um, and what was, what did you say the water temperature was? It's 88 degrees. So 88. I wore a 1.5 <laughs> millimeter suit and it was hot. Oh, but I we were imagine. for five hours a day. So uh, it gets <laughs> not chilly. It just is less warm as the day goes on. Right, right. Um, so I, I, for some people that tuned in a little late, what are what are you doing in diving these days? Are you getting to do any diving? Uh, yeah, so I work at a dive shop called Extreme Exposure, which is in High Springs, Florida. Uh, I also work for... GUE and I'm a product tester for Halcyon. So I do a lot of cave diving essentially in test gear or I just mm -hmm. do cave diving for fun. There's a lot of photos of me. I'm no way a professional model, but <laughs> a bunch of photos of me as well for the same kind of group. Oh, excellent. Um, how long does it take to train a member of the aquatic staff? Uh, so there's six pool tracks right so you can be stage left one stage left two dive com left you can be stage right one stage right two or dive com right uh it takes you have to do each track 30 times with someone watching you before you're proficient um but it takes a long time to do cross training so like to learn every single thing so what normally happens is you learn 
your first trek and then you're there you do that same thing for like mm -hmm. 120 plus days um and then you also learn something called a dry track so they don't want the divers to be in the water all the time so aquatics also happens to do all the special effects stuff so lighting people on fire turning the rain on <laughs> things like that uh and purely because if you're in the water every single day, you will get an ear infection or you will get sick. And then it just spreads through the whole department. So they have like a way to mitigate risk with that. Um, and then you learn your other stage track. And then normally 30 days after you've done your other stage track, you become dive com for a side. So after you can do every single cue, every single thing you have to do underwater and know the show really well, then you become dive com for one side. And then you basically just do that side for like a year or two and then they slowly start teaching you the other sides because they basically just want the department to be able to work on the least amount of people possible in case someone gets sick or someone gets injured or things like that mm -hmm. uh, so you normally learn one track until you kind of learn everything that happens in the pool and then you learn another track and you instantly learn the like dive com side of that track and then you slowly start learning all the other stuff but it takes i didn't i mean i was there for I was there for almost three years and I only learned one track on the right side. <laughs> well, that sounds like a lot. <laughs> um, somebody said they've always heard that landing in the water is more impactful than hitting land. How is the impact lessened for the cast? It's not. They go high dive from like 70 something feet and they, the problem is the pool's not that deep. So the cast members, hit the water and then they have to get as flat as possible to kind of slow their descent through the water and then they still bounce off the floor. So there's actually divers that are sitting underwater to make sure that they don't like hit their head or anything like that. So <laughs> answer is nothing. Nothing is. Because <laughs> um, I know not everyone has seen it. I haven't seen it. Um, is there a is there a plot to the story and do you understand the plot to the story so the plot's very convoluted uh, essentially a girl drops her red handkerchief uh, to a guy that's pulled out of the audience and that guy eventually you will learn is a plant and he is like the guy that travels through the whole world of o to return her handkerchief to her and then for some reason in the first 15 minutes they're standing right next to each other and he tries to give it to her and then she like refuses and then runs away and then it continues. But the last <laughs> thing that happens in the show is he gives her back her handkerchief as she's laying on a piano that sinks into the pool. So <laughs> that's it, that's the whole story. <laughs> that's the story. <laughs> Excellent. Um, do you own all of your own equipment, the full face mask and everything? Uh, I actually don't like diving full face mask or for the context of the shows, everything is provided. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's purely to mitigate liability because you don't want to be responsible for like a regulator breaking or something like that. Right. It should be limited to the company. Uh, personally, I own too much gear, probably, maybe not too much, but I have I have a lot of gear. I'm like in the, like the 30 plus tanks. <laughs> I have a rebreather. I'm about to buy a second rebreather. I have too much stuff as it is, so. <laughs> I'm very involved, but for the show, you don't have to own anything. Everything's provided and you can't even like remove it from the theater. Okay. All right. I guess that makes sense for liability and all that okay. stuff. Um, and you kind of touched on this a little bit. Is there any, I mean, and I know things have kind of changed with COVID and whatnot, but is there any other show like this in the world that you're aware of? Yeah. So, well, maybe not anymore, but, um, <laughs> At pre-COVID, there was La Rev, which is at Windsor in um, Las Vegas. There's two shows in Macau. There's um, one show in Wuhan, which is a carbon copy of O, but it never opened. So I don't know what happened with that. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's another show that's um, produced by Franco Dragon, who is the create, who was previously the creative director of Cirque du Soleil. He has a show also in somewhere in Asia. Uh, I'm just not 100% sure of exactly where it is. Right. Uh, that show went into production in 2015, I think, because I was recruited to be a part of like the, the kind of aquatics team for that show. And then a bunch of stuff fell through. So I don't really know if it was, I don't really know if it's in existence or not. But if you go to Franco Dragon's website, uh, he, he made 
four of the six shows. So if they're listed on his website, then they would still be a thing. Gotcha. Um, this one, I'm not, I'm going to see if I get clarification on it. <laughs> um, do you, do they have water and maybe I'm, I'm it's someone at the museum. So, <laughs> um, I don't know which, who's asking this. Um, maybe, and actually, I guess this actually is kind of a good question. How do they get the water into the other show? Oh, Yes, I think those other shows you were talking about, those are aquatic shows, correct? Yeah, I mean, purely theatrical aquatic shows. Okay, yeah. got it. Okay, that's what they meant with that. So those, all the shows you mentioned, those are other aquatic theatrical shows. Okay, but yeah. actually that's that's another question kind of for, for me actually is how do they get the water in there? And, you know, I mean, is it just kind of like your typical indoor pool that they're supplying it and filtering it and everything? Yeah, I mean, so all the water... So when they drain the pool, it gets drained into the Bellagio fountains mm -hmm. and it raises the water like an inch or something like that. <laughs> um, so it's a pretty substantial amount. I mean, their water lot is very big. Uh, and then when they refill the pool, it's like a five inch, you know, like standpipe that like you would connect a fire hydrant to and it takes mm -hmm. like, it takes like 30 something hours and it's oh, wow, okay. cold. And like, it takes forever for it to get to that hot temperature. Uh, and then backstage, because they have all the air conditioning and stuff, they have like heat lamps essentially for like all the performers and for all the people mm -hmm. that are willing to like not be cold, but it takes a long time for the pool to fill up from empty. Right. <laughs> I can imagine. And they only fill it up once a year. So the water has been recycled for the entire year up until that point. <laughs> well, you know, that's what, what chlorine's for. Yeah, there's um, a guy from Tony. He's like the best pool guy you'll ever meet in your life. <laughs> Whole job is to take care of that gigantic pool system right um were you there i have someone that said they saw o in 2009 were you working for o yet so potentially so i'm the first and only ever intern for the o show that was allowed in the water um so in 2009 if it was in the summer then theoretically yes i would have been <laughs> in the pool um but other than that probably not i was working for disney at that time excellent excellent no that's great so I'll, I'll see if anyone else has does anyone else have any last minute questions i'll give you a second to pop them into the chat because these have been these have been great questions and i've had a lot of folks also saying thank you and they were so excited to you know see this because they've seen the show so to give them an idea of you know what was going on behind or under under the scenes yeah. I guess you could say and it's crazy to me to think about like how absolutely crazy the whole show is especially underwater like the stage managers normally get to do one dive in the show to kind of see, like and so they've they've called every single movement cue like in the show and mm -hmm. there's thousands of them and like a normal theatrical show has like maybe maybe 250 maybe 400 you know and there's like 4,000 in oh Oh, wow. And then they get to go underwater for the first time and like people have to like move them around so that they're like not in people's way and things like that. Cause it's like a big, you know, big traffic jam just waiting to happen underwater. <laughs> Excellent. Welcome back, Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've been fascinated. I, as I've seen several uh, Cirque du Soleil's and each one has got so many surface related theatrics and so many people to add underwater is is just amazing so thank you for uh walking us through that yeah no worries thanks for having me and as a thank you for coming the history of diving museum would like to and linnea <laughs> just delivered um a one-year membership so you too can come to the history of diving museum Perfect. 362 days a year and all the people that you bring with you um will get in at a member's discount there's Perfect. also a uh, discount in the museum store. So uh, you got, you came in early, you got to see a little sneak peek of the diving and pop culture, but we appreciate you coming down and uh, coming back when you do your diving adventures. Thank you so much. Excellent. Well, excellent everyone. Um, I think we'll then be signing off every, I keep getting more thank yous and whatnot. Um, like Lisa said, May 19th, 7 p.m. Um, Retired Rear Admiral uh, Martha Erb is going to be talking about, you know, women in 
Navy diving history. She was a um, one of the first women to get into the explosive ordnance um, units and everything. So it'll be really fascinating. So register, you know, si send me your emails and stuff, and I'll get you the links and whatnot. And thank you for joining us. And um, do we find that on your face? Yes, I can. I I'll have the future events on our Facebook as well, and I can email you the link too. Um, but thank you for everyone for joining and we will see you next month and thank you will and so long everyone and thanks for all the fish <laughs> <laughs> bye everybody